This podcast is made possible by Venna. Hi, this is Amberine Tubasi, CFO of Airtable, and you are listening to the CFO Thought Leaders Podcast. This is episode 869. Obviously, you need to balance both growth and profitability, as I said, and you need to take care of your customers. Customer satisfaction, high net promoter score, that is extremely important. You have a good, huge product set and big market. I think those are certain foundational things for the company. You want to raise some money, create some liquidity for the employees. It's wonderful. It's a great experience. Good to be ringing the bell on NYSE or NASDAQ. But at the same time, the most important foundational part is how do you grow the company? How do you take care of your customers? How do you support the employee base? And we are working on that part. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with Ravi Narula, CFO of Financial Force. Looking back, CFO Ravi Narula tells us that he wishes he had become a servant leader sooner in his career. Servant leader, that style of leadership that deems the number one goal of leaders is to serve others. Narula tells us 15 years ago, if we had asked him whether he was a servant leader, his answer would have to have been no. It was only after attending a graduate executive program that explored corporate culture and the leadership styles which help support it. Did Narula match his financial acumen with a servant leadership style he now credits with helping him advance down the CFO path? That story and much more on today's episode. We begin after this. Managing multiple spreadsheets, disconnected data, numbers you just can't trust. Your finance team can't be the strategic partner your organization needs right now with obstacles like that getting in your way. Venna can change that. Venna brings people, processes, and systems together in a single collaborative analytical platform so you can drive connected business planning and better decision making. And it's the only native Excel complete planning platform built for Microsoft 365 with Power BI embedded. With Venna, your financial and operational data is always connected and your teams are always armed with insights and time to focus on what matters most. So when the stakes are high and the margin for error low, plan with agility, plan with resilience, Plan with Venna so you can be prepared for whatever comes next. Visit venasolutions.com slash planning aces to learn more about how Venna will help you plan for anything. Hello, we're speaking with Ravi Narula, CFO of Financial Force. Ravi, welcome. Thank you, Jack, for having me here. Pleasure, my pleasure. So, Ravi, we're going to begin with our uh, top of uh, top of the show question, which is to ask you to look back for us, try to identify some of those experiences you feel best prepared you for this role. What would those be? Interesting question, Jack. Uh, if I go back at certain stages of my life in my career, one which stands out, this is early on, earlier on in my career, actually, once I was going to start my CPA career before that, I had one season where I was doing tax returns. And I was, I had done major in accounting and finance and taxes. So I was pretty good in the, on the technical side. And the tax season in Canada, I was doing it. And in the mid, right a week or 10 days before the end of the tax season, I had done all the tax returns, which was uh, given to me. And I was a junior tax person at that time. So I was pretty good in technical side. And then what really happened was 
there were some 15 days left and the, my manager came to me saying, Ravi, why don't you start making calls to some of the individuals who had come in a year ago for taxes, but they have not come this year. So remind them. So I made calls. I made first call, second call, 15th call. I had to leave voicemails for some people. Some people said they will come. Some folks said they won't be able to come because they got the taxes done otherwise. Then must have been the 14th, the 15th, or 16th call. So I called one lady and I said, Miss XYZ, you had your taxes done last year. Can you When can you come in for tax returns this year? And she must have had some bad experience with the company I was at that time. So she said, you creatures, you'd never, ever call me back again. Uh, just and, and she hung up. And I felt very bad. I said, she called me a creature. I took it personally. So I was like, this is my early 20 year. I was in my early 20s. And I was literally stunned with it. I was shaken. And I went in the kitchen and I was literally about to cry type situation. And my manager comes over and he says, Ravi, what's happening? I said, no. He said, what happened? He said, I said, she called me a creature. And this is at 10.30 in the morning. And she said, he said, let's go for drinks. So he took me out for drinks, a beer at 10.30, 10.45 in the morning. What I really learned, Jack, in the process was not only the technical side is important as a finance leader, but also interpersonal skills, communication skills, sales skills are very critical. And just keeping an eye for those things, developing your skills, whether it's outside your technical accounting skills, was very important for me. And I feel why where I am today as a CFO of Financial Force is because of some of the other interpersonal and soft skills I developed in the last 20 plus years. So I tell this story because this is something uh, we as finance people especially feel, hey, I know my accounting side, finance side, IR, investor relations side, as well as other aspects of the business, which is directly related. But we are all salespeople. Communication is important. Interpersonal skills, they're all very, very important. So it was one of the pivotal mo moments in my career, which helped me, uh, my career go up and beyond from there. I would say that was one big learning I had earlier on in my life. There, I will tell you one other one, which is not a very big proud moment, but it is something which where I learned a lot actually, was when I failed. Uh, this is now 10 years after that learning episode. And what really happened, Jack, was this is when Sox, Sarbanes Oxley was first coming in, uh, was implemented and lots of public companies had adopted. There were no project management skills. I was in a company which had subsidiary 20, subsidiaries in 20 plus countries. So very complicated situation. And there were hundreds of tasks for each country. So there's a big Excel spreadsheet I had to maintain as a project manager. And there were no systems or solutions where you could automate all of that hundreds and thousands of tasks in one place. And so you had to manually maintain it. But re running through this, having the CFO at that time, look at those, the audit partner at the accounting firm, sometimes the chairman or the audit committee would come in. And I was doing a pretty good job with 100 plus consultants reporting in for this project. So it was a complicated project management task. And what I think I was traveling one week, I missed some of the key inputs during that time. And I found out some of the inputs I would have received, should have received, didn't got incorporated, something I missed out. And there was a fiasco at that time. And during that time, I was, my, my, my immediate manager stepped in when the situation was tough. He helped me in this process, calm things down. And I learned in the process two important things. One was project management is very, very critical. Obviously, if you make progress, but you don't have good project management skills or good communication process there, uh, things will get under represented or reported, which is not a good thing. So you need to build confidence with the people. And for that, having being tight on project management is critical. And second is about uh, if you have your people, sometimes they have some challenges. How do you step in and support them during those tough, challenging times? So I I found my boss. He's one of my biggest mentors in life, even after 20 years now. So I think I learned a lot in not only improving my 
project management skills as well as making sure I'm communicating appropriately and timely, but also how do I help the my people who report into me, how do I support them when they have some challenges going on? So I think uh, learning and just overall as part of the journey in career, it's about learning, improving, continuous improvement, and how do you support and how do you have fun at the end of the day? So you have to uh, you have to do this and give back to your people, give back to your team, give back to your society. So not only professionally, but also personally. How do you give back some of those learnings and uh, help you got from other people? How do you give back to the society and to the younger generation? Hope this is helpful well, in but... terms of my career journey. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's it's interesting, and you zeroed right in on those interpersonal skills right away for us, which I think is interesting. Often it is something uh, our interviews reveal later in the career, but it seems like you were sensitive to to it early on. Um, what one of the areas we are hoping to we always like to highlight is sort of the segues. You had opportunities, perhaps different opportunities, to move into industry. You jumped to Borland. Share with us some of the decision making uh, as you decide to leave Deloitte. What would you tell us? Yeah, I was at Deloitte in three different countries, US, Canada, and India. So I have had great experience with Deloitte and it was a wonderful experience I got. It was, uh, I learned a lot about technical project management, people skills, lots of uh, client, different client needs. So it was very diverse experience, not only an audit, tax, IPOs, M&A, due diligence, acquisition, just restructuring, lots of those bankruptcies. So very, very varied experience at Deloitte. So I was having a wonderful time at Deloitte. And then at one point in my career, uh, before I jumped to Borland, I decided, I said, do I want, and I was a senior manager, third year senior manager on the path for partnership. I said, do I want to go this path? Path or do I want to go and be a CFO one day? One of the client I had uh, when I was at Deloitte and the CFO of that client of that public company, and I was on that account for four or five years, the CFO of that uh, public company asked me, what are your career aspirations? And I was providing good client service at that time and very good relationship with the CFO, the controller and other folks. I said, let me think about it and come back to you. That was a turning point. I said, I, do I really know where I'm going? Do I want to be a partner or do I want to be going into industry and become more like him? That was, he was a great career aspiration for me. And I said, path to, to partnership at Deloitte is amazing. amazing. I would be very, would have been very, very happy. But I said, I would love to follow this CFO who has been a mentor for me in this process. So that was the turning point. And I said, I am going to be a CFO like you one day. And from that time on, he, he has mentored me throughout the process. In the And even now, I would have calls with him once in a while, once in six months, and say, okay, this is the situation I have. The good thing is I do get calls in return from him. And he said, Ravi, I'm experiencing these challenges. So it's a two-way journey now. But it was a great experience. It was a good question, which I got stumped on. But I think that was something, uh, that was the decision I had to make at that time. And then I joined Borland from there. Well, you did. And then you, of course, you, you move on to a more senior finance role. And then in the not too distant future, really, uh, within the next four to five years, you're you're in the CFO office. Is that sort of accurate? That is right. Yes, I joined Borland in 2004 and uh, in 2000, early 2010, I was a CFO. Yes. So in five plus years, I became the CFO of a public company. Well, we will likely, Ravi, have a few more uh, career related questions for you during the mentoring round. But right now, let's find out about your latest CFO career chapter at Financial Force. Tell us about this company. What does it do? And what are its offerings today, really? Yeah, Financial Force uh, is a software company. We are a private company based headquartered in San Francisco. Just to give you a perspective, which would be, people will understand, two or three big product areas which we do. One is 
I was giving you the example of the SOX project management I was doing in terms of we didn't I was doing all of those in Excel in early uh, in early 2000s. Now we have solution. One of the solutions for financial force is called professional services automation. So if somebody has professional services organization or customer service organization, how do you optimize and all the professional services time is money for them every hour which is spent will uh, billing them or not billing them has an impact on the top, uh, top line so we are able to provide a solution which is automated solution called psa professional services automation and that takes away all the manual process out it helps reduce the revenue leakage for the company also it helps provide which projects are on time what's happening on that process and utilization for lots of our customers all our customers go up in terms of prof uh, professional services organization the margins go up so it basically we help them with automation helps them with save saving time and productivity improvement that's one of the key solutions for us second lots of cfos would love it is we sell erp uh, accounting systems accounting and planning systems so we have a financial force accounting system where you can record all your GL accounting or bank reconciliations, it's your in-house accounting system. So not only professional services automation, we have the ERP solution. And now we have expanded further products to planning and analysis. So whether it's financial planning analysis or some other analysis, you can have that. And we are expanding into the service industry, service side more. So CS, uh, customer service cloud also, services cpq so we're expanding on the services industry a lot more so we are in 10 plus countries around the world we have th more than 1000 customers uh, lots of those customers are in the top fortune 100 but we range from top customers all the way to medium sized businesses also so very diversified company and I'm the cfo at financial force now now you arrive in uh, 2021 you step into the cfo office here and uh, again, I mentioned uh, you had, uh, we didn't mention this during uh, your career uh, narrative, but you have taken certain companies public in the past, participated in that, those transactions. Can you maybe just give us an abbreviated history of financial forces uh, capital structure? Is it privately owned and is it venture backed or how would you characterize it? Yes, you're right. Uh, two things. One, I've been part of a number of IPOs, three IPOs as a controller or CFO in my past. And Financial Force is a private company. It's growing very well. It's diversified. It's great products, great industry, every aspect of it. I'm very, very happy to be part of this organization. Uh, in terms of capital structure, company was uh, company was originally founded in 2009. Actually, we are on Salesforce platform. So we were the first company on Salesforce platform as an ISV. And Salesforce is a small investor in the company also. Along with that, we are in a very good position from an invest, investor perspective. We have Advent, one of the best PE firms, which has roughly 50% ownership in the company. Then we have a VC firm called TCV. Uh, so great, great uh, investors in the company who are very growth oriented focused on how do we, because we are in a very good uh, space market, how do we grow as a company? How do we, and that's how our board, our investors and the management team thinks about how do we create shareholder value by growing well? Obviously you have to balance both growth and profitability, but we have wonderful and amazing long-term investors who believe in the company. As you step into the role, what chapter are you opening up for this company? And I guess, you know, I, I did do a quick uh, Google search and there is IPO buzz around the company. Uh, and yes, Ravi would be the one, I suppose, who might be able to take this company public. How am I doing? Am I close to uh, what you think your chapter might include? I hope so. But obviously, Jack, the key thing for any CFO is how do you create a company which can grow and scale as a company, whether it's private or public? In my view, IPO is a milestone. It's not the destination. So successful companies, whether they're private or they're public, they focus on long-term growth of the business. Obviously, you need to balance both growth and profitability, as I said, and you need to take care of your customers. 
customer satisfaction, high net promoter score, that is extremely important. You have a good, huge product set and big market. I think those are certain foundational things for the company. Uh, you want to raise some money, create some liquidity for the employees. It's wonderful. It's a great experience. Good to be ringing the bell on some place, uh, NYSE or NASDAQ. So it's good to have those, but at the same time, the most important foundational part is how do you grow the company? How do you take care of your customers? How do you support the employee base? And we are working on that part. IPO, it's a very tough market at this time. Economic environment is very challenging. So not many, I don't think there have been any software IPOs other than one company, uh, which was a spin-off of, of, of Intel. I, I have not seen any IPOs in the last 12 months, but at one point, companies which are growing well, which are surviving, uh, which are sustaining growth, which are growing well, managing the top line and bottom line will come out and be ready for IPO. Obviously, you need to, besides growth and business, you need to focus on infrastructure as a public company. Do you have enough predictability? Do you have enough uh, team which can help grow and scale the organization? So something during these times, it's good to have good, talented individuals working with you and helping them develop and helping improve the processes. Something which I really in, enjoy and I've uh, and I'm enjoying here at Financial Force also. Have you have you uh, did you reorganize finance in some way since your arrival? Is there something you added or took away? Uh, there's always changes. A change is something which happens every time. Uh, and when I joined, it's a little bit over 20 months now. So I had, I, just before I, before I go details, obviously I'm responsible for accounting, finance, IR side, uh, it's IT, security, facility, so it's, and deal stuff. So it's a pretty wide range of responsibilities I have. And one is, as you, first and foremost, you come in and you say, okay, what are, the company's goals, what is the CFO's vision and mission? And I created those things. And then I got my senior leadership together and say, okay, these are the various vision and mission statements we have. This is the, my goal for long term. How do I, how do we as a team as achieve those or exceed those goals? So something, it's an evolution and lots of, and I look for individuals who are, who have aspirations to replace me as a CFO who want to grow in their career. How do I help them? Those are certain things I evaluate. And as as part of the process, I've added more people, I've hired people, I've up-leveled some of those, but I do feel you need to build a team which can actually replace you. And the more you have people who are willing to step up and do and see not where the company is today, but where the company is going in two or three years from now, uh, the more of those individuals, the company is better off. And I feel I'm blessed to have a wonderful team at Financial Force who scales, who has scaled very well, who is helping the business grow extremely well. And if I don't show up for a day or two days, company and the process keeps working. That's success for me. And I feel we are at a very good position from that perspective. So... I, I suspect uh, when we talk about your lines of sight and the metrics that you pay close attention to, uh, it's going to be about unit economics and it's going to be about recurring revenue and it's about uh, customer churn and uh, li customer lifetime value. How am I doing or lifetime customer value? How am I doing? Am I close uh, to your world? You know the stuff very well. I would put some of these metrics in two buckets, Jack. You're right. You're, you're seeing this thing a long time, so you know it, especially for a SaaS company. What I, I do, I break those metrics in two buckets, leading indicators and lagging indicators. As a CFO, I, I spent a lot more time on the data analytics side and more on the leading indicators. I think you you said it very well, whether it's customer lifetime, the churn side. I think even beyond, the, before those, I look at, as I mentioned earlier, customer satisfaction. I look at net promoter score. Those are very, very critical for the business. And it's not when a customer comes in and how much money they give, they give me, what's my revenue, what is my retention rate. They are, I think they are important metrics, but uh, is a customer happy? What's the adoption rate? Those are very critical as aspects. 
the more we look at those things, the lagging indicators, whether it's revenue, whether it's gross margins, whether it's profitability, they become very predictable and they become actually improved. They keep improving there. So in my view, the more deeper I go into data analytics, the better, the more I know about the business and you keep peeling the onion and you keep understanding. And that's something I feel lots of CFOs do it. All CFOs should focus on and invest in data side of it. So, and we are a data-driven company. Data strategy is at the core of our business. We have a corporate data analytics team here now. So we, the more, uh, and we have expanded that team. I have an fp a team, which is very critical, which understands the business puts and takes. And that's what helps drive the behavior and the culture of the company. Obviously, at the end of the day, there are two aspects. One is top line growth and one is uh, managing profitability. But lots of these metrics, as you mentioned earlier, helps both helps drive both of those top line as well as the bottom line. That emphasis that you've put on data and how important it is to, uh, you know, uh, your role as a CFO today, you have a point of comparison because, again, we pointed out you were a CFO beginning back in 2010 and you had a, another CFO chapter in between then and now. More data than ever, though, however, you have your lines of sight are deeper. As you said, you want to look into that data even deeper. There's tools available to do that, but it's also an organizational thing where your conversations that you're having are not just with your finance team anymore. They're with data scientists. They're with other parts of the organization where you're trying to help them make decisions better. So there might be data related to their activities that you're Finance might be helping them explore or study or understand. Uh, how am I doing? Am I am I right? I mean, how, and what I'm getting at is how you operate as a finance leader has likely changed from how you did ten years ago, just because there's so much more data that's informing you. Yeah, I think you're right. There's lots of data, and initially, ten, fifteen years ago, when data growth was happening. And I think even where we are today, in five years from now, data will double. So data is not going away. I think it's going to become more and more. The success for the CFOs are, how do they leverage the data so they have good, useful information on time so they can do the predict, whether they can predict what's going to happen or start working with, whether it's the customer success um, individuals, whether it's the sales individuals, whether it's product side, and build the data uh, algorithms into the equation so that way you are not surprised. Uh, it's, it'll be a journey. It evolves, but investing into data science, investing into technology, and having the mindset and culture of being a data-driven company is very important. And it's not lots of times, even 10, 15 years ago, as you said, I used to look at the financial results is how is my revenue doing? How is the gross margin? What's my cost of revenue? What is my expenses? And I used to feel good about it. I, and I do still have to look at those. They are very important to be, whether it's a private company or public company, those are some of the standard measurements you have to have. But a lot more in emphasis gets put in. I can look at my, I have a CFO dashboard. I can look at what is happening real time with my average recurring revenue? What is my net dollar retention rate? What's my RPO, remaining performance obligation? How many customers do I have at one point of time, whether it's at 8 a.m. or whether it's 5 p.m. in the afternoon, evening? I have access to all that data. And once I have it, I can follow up with people saying, okay, what is this something I should be aware of it? So purpose of that is create a culture and mindset within the organization that everybody, one, is using the same um, same data to make decisions, and that data is one. The second is available real-time on your fingertips so you can take actions quickly if something you need to address it. So I think we, I feel that is at the heart and center of any CFO, and it's something I really, really embrace and invest into it. Just want to, uh, you mentioned the net promoter score, I think more than once. Uh, and I'm curious, is the net promoter score pretty much widely known across the organization? Is it a metric that perhaps goes the widest in terms of how many people have that metric available to them? What would you tell us? We have 1,000 people in the company, Jack, 
and today i'll tell you and even before today's meeting people would have i would have said 80 to 90 percent of the people would have known the net promoter score today we had the town hall meeting and we had within an hour 20 minutes were devoted to the net promoter score that is the culture of the company that's the culture of the organization whether it's from engineering to finance to it to sales to marketing everybody knows net promoter score and we talked about our net promoter score by geography by product side by industry by by customer segment side all of those net promoter and blended promote net promoter score the trend line in that we are extremely happy we are very transparent organization at financial force we discuss all of these things within the company and we discuss with our customer base also we have a customer advisory board we discuss the net promoter score uh, with those and say okay we have and we are very very happy to have amazing customers and we get extremely high net promoter score but our job is how do we continue to improve from there so something we are very open to even our customers also on our net promoter score besides all the employees where did you arrive at uh, financial force as a, a net promoter score champion of sorts or um is it you arrived here and they were uh, they had the religion, so likewise you got it. Uh, or had you? I'm sure you were aware the Net Promoter Score has been around for twenty something years. Curious as your evolution of a finance leader, you certainly seem to believe in the Net Promoter Score now more than ever. Our chief customer officer said it well today. He said Net Promoter Score is a team sport, and it is in fact right. Whether it's a churn, whether it's renewals, or whether it's NPS score, is a team sport. It's not one organization, one individual, one department, it's all of us. Our CEO, Scott, is a huge fan of customer satisfaction, making sure the customers are very happy. I was his first hire. He came in two years ago. I came in right after that. Uh, and he is a big champion of going, uh, supporting the customers. He, he was in sales for a long time. And I feel I'm privileged to be working with him and the other management team members to focus on customer first. And I think this is a, co a company which is really puts customer first. And so it's not just me, it's not just Scott, it's everybody, whether it's from sales side, marketing people, customer success individuals, all of them together. That's why I said it's a real team sport. And we, I feel, strongly feel that we really focus on that as a overall company. Well, you arrived here uh, sort of in the in the pandemic. Twenty one, we were chasing after vaccines, and uh, during that period, finance leaders became a little more aware of some of the talent challenges within their own company. A lot of the businesses went remote, and employee engagement became a subject to, of discussion. Whether a company was going to have a hybrid model or not have a hybrid model was all something being discussed. Still is. And I'm wondering if your mindset as far as talent began to evolve somewhat, began to began to take more of your time, perhaps, as you as the company tried to understand better its own talent challenges. Anything you will share in regards to talent? I would say generally speaking, I'll give you a general answer than what has changed for me in the last two years. I'll say that in more detail. So generally speaking, for technology companies, talent is the, the biggest asset. We might say IP is, but talent, without the talent, there's no IP, there's no customer also. So I do feel talent, for especially for a technology company, software company, is extremely important because that's where innovation happens, all of that stuff. But I would say, and previously we all used to be in the office, we would have the structured perspective of, hey, we, we need to be all together to be productive. That one has changed over the last two years for me. I think individuals need to be motivated. They need to be focused on, can I take more responsibilities? Can I help the company more? Can I help the organization, my team more? So being a team player, being having a career aspirations, being more engaged is a lot more important than showing, seeing somebody every day in the office or not. I do come to the office regularly, but half the time most of the time people are not there but the quality of the work productivity of the team has gone up so i do feel my perspectives about talent has changed uh, the importance of talent has not changed it's so important it's one of the most important aspect whether you're a public company private company growth or not doesn't matter talent is important 
But what perspective has changed is that we want to be with such a with with such a key asset, which is talent. I need, I have become more flexible in terms of my understanding perspective. Hey, you can be as productive wherever you are, whether you're in Hawaii or whether you're working from home or whether you're working in the office or in the morning or evening. I think more engaged individuals, wherever they are, is a critical asset for the company. And I've become a lot more responsive to, towards that. And I think one of the key elements for a CFO and as a leader is recognizing those talent, the talent which is has lots of career aspirations, which is very motivated. And that's one of the things which is a little bit hard because if you are not meeting those individuals in person, how do you identify the talent and say, okay, this is somebody I need to invest my time in. How do I support this individual so they can grow in their career, whether within the company or even outside? I think that's some, one of the responsibilities of a CFO. Identify the talent who they can support and in their career, in their team's career journey. So I feel that piece has become slightly challenging because not everybody comes to the office. So it's my responsibility. Other leaders' responsibility to reach out to the individuals and help support them. But overall, talent is critical for any organization and especially for a technology company like our, like Financial Force. Does, uh, does the company use OKRs, objectives, and key results? Is- Absolutely, yes. Oh, we do. We are now in the, we have a January year end, so we are wrapping up our year end. And for February, we already have uh, one meeting on the OKRs for fiscal 24, which is coming up next, starting on Feb 1st. But we do our big believe, we are a big believer starting from Scott Brown all the way to the company in terms of expanding onto OKRs. And OKRs have to be somewhat stretch goals also. So we really focus on and we, we support uh, we don't have to meet every objective. We were discussing this a week, 10 days ago. There, there could be some goals. If every every objective turns out to be green, we are not pushing ourselves enough. So I think we have, we have a understanding expectation. We need to strive for a stretch goals and support our goal, so support our team members to be successful. And if they miss some, we miss something, that's totally acceptable. Jack, if I may just take one other aspect, one of the things which I really embellish the company's culture has is servant leadership. It's not only having a key talent and workforce, but also how do I serve the individuals, whether within my team or outside. As a leader, we have an obligation to the employees. How do I support you? Whether it's through mentorship activities, whether it's just casual conversations, how do I help other people within their company to be successful? I think that's that servant leadership's uh, culture is extremely important and valuable for me as well as for other ESTAP members. Yeah, can I can I ask just as far as yourself and your career and your earlier CFO chapters, did you view always view yourself as a servant leader? It was it something you discovered along the way, meaning, you know, this really matches closely with my approach to managing people? I I wish I wanted to say I was always a servant leader. I was not. I learned it. Uh, I discovered it through a number of years journey, but not, uh, if you ask me 15 years ago, was I, did I have the same mindset? Unfortunately, I would say, no, I did not. Uh, I went for a program, a CFO program, at Stanford in early 2010, so maybe 2013 or 2014. And that was CFO program and there were 50 CFOs. They had a limp cutoff of 50 CFOs. They came from 22 different countries, obviously 10 or 15 of those were from US, but they came from all around the world, including Saudi Arabia, for example, South Africa, uh, Brazil, Australia, everywhere. And that was a wonderful experience spending months with them working with them, understanding those aspects of it. And in that process, my first reaction going into the program was, obviously I want to learn about strategy, execution. And the first couple of weeks was about accounting. And I said, oh my God, this is so boring. I know I know this stuff inside out. Then it went into strategy, execution, and I enjoyed it. And the third 
section of that program was about culture in the company. And that was the best learning I got out of it. Not in terms, and there were so, so many case, case studies about it, which companies had done a wonderful job, which companies were successful with those. And is it the CEO driving the culture? No. Is it just one person? No. It's everybody, including a CFO. And how do we embrace a positive culture within an organization? How do we support the people? So all that stuff actually resonated a lot more with me. And the more it started happening, it became easy for me to follow up and make it make it better and better from there. So it's a journey. There was no one event, but I do think the program at Stanford actually helped me think much broader than accounting and finance CFO or from a strategy perspective or from execution it was much more including servant leadership, including culture within the company. They are so foundational, so so paramount for success of a company, success for the CFO also. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ravi. Appreciate it. The extra detail there. We are going to jump to what we refer to as our finance strategic moment question, where I ask you to once again, look back in time and sort of cherry pick out for us one experience you had where you had a moment of strategic insight that led you to avoid a risk, pursue an opportunity, change things up. I don't know. But when you look back, is there anything that might be a finance strategic moment for you? Uh, so we are going through uncertain times at this time, right? Economic environment is challenging. Recession risks are there. Uh, market Stock market has gone down significantly. Unemployment is going up. Just inflation is there, interest rates, all those things. If you look at 2008 and 2009, I think the situation was not too far off from where we are today. We had similar situations, financial crisis, companies had gone bankrupt, lots of stock market was down, real estate market was going down. And I would say those at that time, we had a situation, we had, to, we had a decision to make at that time saying, hey, do we, as lots of other companies are doing, what do we do? Do we just hunker down uh, or look at, key, look at our long-term vision, long-term strategy and invest based on that? That was a decision and you could argue both sides. Companies are going out of business. Cash was becoming very expensive. Hey, we should not be investing. We should hunker down, become profitable, deal with it. Or hey, we, this is a time when other companies are backing off. This is a time to invest. So I think those that decision, that discussion, not even the decision. The decision came as a result of the dis, decision discussion. That discussion about what do we really want? What are we solving for? Are we solving for short term issues, or are we solving for long term? became a real critical discussion for us and and one that was one aspect the second one was how do we get everybody aligned with that same conclusion was very important so alignment within the key management team members board members was extremely important this first one was hey don't lose sight of the long term don't lose sight of the strategy of the business versus just reacting to what the either the stock market or investors or somebody is doing. So look at both of those things. I think that overall discussion, decision making really helped me as a finance leader, which has, which has made me a strategic CFO versus just focusing on number crunching or I would say 10, 15 years ago, CFOs used to be very back office minded. Now it's about focusing on the business and the growth. And I look at risk from two perspectives, Jack. One is operational risk, the business risk. The other one is accounting and finance risk. And myself as a CFO who's focusing on growth, I am much more open to today taking operational and business risks. Means, hey, if this is a good time to invest, invest in the business for growth as long as you're managing your top line and bottom line well. But I focus on that piece. But I do not take risk on accounting and finance. That's something is not worth it as a CFO. So that experience in 2008 and 2009 really helped me understand 
the value of differentiating business risk versus accounting and finance risk. And I think that has paid off for me in my career and the companies I've been involved with. And I feel very good about financial force also that we are investing in good talent, good products, good customers, even in today's environment versus, hey, we should just doing do the same thing what 20, 20 or 100 other companies are doing. So I feel that culture and that experience of mine is helping me and my other my companies a lot a lot in the process. Hi, it's Jack. I hope you're enjoying our discussion with CFO Ravi Narula of Financial Force. Interestingly, once more we have a CFO making a comparison with the economically challenging times of past decades, drawing on that experience to help them assess their business's current economic challenges. We now enter the mentoring round with CFO Ravi Narula. We're going to jump to the mentoring round where we ask you several quick questions intended to inspire and inform future finance leaders. We'd like you to think back to that first time you stepped into a CFO role. So back in, in 2010, Ravi, uh, that first 60 days, 90 days you were in that role, if you could go back and give yourself just a, a small piece of advice, what would it have been? I, I think first time CFO is always a hard one. Right? The role is hard. There are lots of expectations from the board, from the management team, investors, everybody, employee side of it. Uh, and it was daunting. I'll be very honest. It was. I had lots of stressful nights also besides the days in terms of how do I deal with it? How do I prepare for the earnings call? How do I prepare for the board meeting as a CFO now? You, there's nobody else you can look at and say, okay, that person is going to jump in. And all that conversation, all that process in the first 60 days was exhausting for me. But if I have to give advice to new CF, finance leaders who will become CFOs or new CFOs, you're not alone in that journey. Look for help. There are so many people, whether it's your boss, whether it's your board members, reach out to them or your mentors or actually find alliances or peer groups who can help you or find a coach. Invest in yourself. If you invest in yourself and not do it, try to do it alone, I think you'll be way better off. You'll make better decisions, right decisions quickly without having to put stress in yourself. So I do feel, I wish I had done that. I went through the process much more challenging. I did have my former boss my, is my mentor. He helped me in the process from the East Coast, but I could and should have used other help a lot more than I did. Because I was fighting it alone and you don't have to fight alone. You are part of a company, you're part of a group, you're part of an organization which is there to support you and take the help. Re seek out the help. You may not get the help by from everybody. You may you should seek out and you there are so many people who are willing to help you in the process. So don't be shy of that. Excellent. Thank you. Uh we always like to ask our guests to reflect a little bit on the personal side for us. We're wondering if you have a habit or Part of a daily routine that you're known for, it sets you apart from others, uh, something a family member might point out to us uh, rather than a colleague, it, they know you best, something you've done over time. Anything come to mind when we ask for a personal habit or routine that you have? Uh, so when I come to the office, I'm always, the first thing I do is to get a cup of coffee. But if I'm home I never, and I have a coffee machine, latte machine, I never go to the coffee machine. I pick up a cup of tea. And, and, and that's something I like, I enjoy. Uh, so my family, even when we were out during the Christmas break, holiday, uh, New Year's break, we went on an RV trip. And my wife said, hey, let's just make some Tea. And I said, no, this is my responsibility. You guys stay away from five feet away from the stove at the RV also. So I like to enjoy my cup of tea in the morning before I would have my first cup of coffee in the office. So it's something 
I just love it, enjoy it, and I like making it also. <laughs> different flavors and different blends of tea. You're not alone. We, there are a few tea drinkers we've had uh, confessions here. I don't know why. But... Wonderful. <laughs> if you don't drink coffee. I should make a group of that then. All right. <laughs> no offense. The, the, um, we wonder if you have a book recommendation for us. It doesn't have to be a business book. It might be something you escape with, something you've read that you think is worth mentioning. Uh, I'll give you actually two. One is a business book. I think it's not a, it's the name does not make it a business book, but I think I've learned, I've gone back to the book so many times. And I think it's a, it's a real book to help the businessmen, including CFOs. You probably have heard of it. It's probably one of the oldest books in the history, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And it's 2,500 years old, but I'll tell you why I do like that book. From a business perspective, it, it it's about war, how to prepare for it. So the learnings I got out of it, how do you prepare to be successful as a CFO, to be successful as a leader, to be successful as a person? We all, we don't spend enough time preparing for things. How do you prepare? How do you analyze? How do you anticipate? And then obviously, how do you execute? So I do feel that book has given me lots of time, the energy to understand and prepare for it. And when you have to deal with competition in terms of pricing, when you have to deal with other things, it's good to take the time and moment to learn about importance of planning and preparing for it. So I do feel this is a wonderful book to understand and read. And then I'm a, I am a thriller junkie. I do like just something which if I remember, great. If I don't remember, I don't care about it. So <laughs> Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, I like it. Just you might call it why, but I love that book. It's just it's a great escape for me. I just if I read that book three times, fourth time doesn't matter, doesn't bother me. I just get engrossed into that. So I'm a junkie for I would say Da Vinci Code. If you say what did I learn in that process, I didn't even try to learn anything. I just said okay, let me just read the book. Let me enjoy the book. <laughs> did you enjoy the movies or no? Not as much. Uh, I do enjoy the movies. I don't. I I'm lucky actually, Jack. Being from India originally, I get to watch both Hollywood and Bollywood movies, so I can enjoy more, much more, many more movies than you and you do, generally speaking, because I do love movies. Uh, I actually think the book is outstanding. I would, I would not give up the book over the movie, but I love movie was great, but I, I think the just the book by itself. Yeah. And the advantage of the book is you can read it when you want. It's just so much more fun. Hey, Ravi, we enjoyed speaking with you. We are up to our final question where we ask you to look forward finally for us. And we're wondering uh, over the next 12 months what your priorities are as CFO of Financial Force. What would those be? Given the economic environment we are in, I would say there are three things I would say. Continue growing the business. We are growing the business we have been growing the business. We need to continue to grow the business. We need to believe in our people, believe in our product, believe in the market, customers. And I think we are very well positioned to keep doing it. So that's one thing which I feel is important and we are doing it. So that's one. Second is continue developing the team. I think as we talked about workforce, the people side, team is the biggest asset we have and we, any company will have. So we need to continue developing the team aspiring leaders, new individuals, how do we make them feel at home, whether they're working in the office, working from home, whether they're new or been with the company. Like just today when we had the town hall, uh, five people in my team this month met five year anniversaries. So I sent them those notes. So I think it's whether individuals who have been there for five years or I have one individual in my team who has been with the company as well as the parent of the company for 25 years. So it's individuals. How do you make everybody, all, uh, people with tenure or new people, make them feel at home is something important and give them give them what they need for, the, for their long-term career journey. So that's the second thing I would say. And I think you touched base on the other one, a company which is scaling uh, and wants, will grow, create value for the shareholders have to have a predictability in there. And this is a, especially, and I wouldn't have called it out earlier on, but given the uncertain environment we are in, I think creating predictability, 
within the business, within the workforce in terms of, hey, we are growing. We want all our people. We are very selective in hiring. We want when we hire people, we want to fully, fully support them. I think it's very important. So understanding, anticipating the uncertainties and proactively dealing with those, I think is very important. So those are the three things I would probably say are important for me in the next 12 to 18 months. Ravi Narula, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thank you, Jack, for having me. It was wonderful. I very much appreciate the time with you. Hello, Thought Leader listeners. As you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as Thought Leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at cfothoughtleader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page. And you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.